Back in September in 2023, Tata Steel made an announcement that it agreed with the UK government to invest in a new form of steel making at its Port Talbot plant here in South Wales. That investment of £1.25 billion was to invest in an electric arc furnace, a 3 million tonnes per year electric arc furnace, as well as some improvements to some of the existing assets such as the continuous casters, the hot rolling mill and the picker line in the cold mill. That decision by Tata Steel and the UK government to build an electric arc furnace to be commissioned in 2027 changed every other decision the business was going to make about its iron and steel making assets because it knew that in four years time a lot of those assets wouldn't be required. Come January 2024 the company was making losses of £1.7 million a day and in light of those two things it announced a restructuring of the business and to propose to close the heavy end assets during the year of 2024. Now because of those decisions there's been some doubt about whether the company would actually build an electric arc furnace at all or, and that its model of importing slab and hot roll coil uh, during that intermediate period would be sufficient to continue through into the future. National media of Ask TV Narendra and senior managers in the business of Ask TV Narendra, are we actually going to have an electric arc furnace? He has said 100% yes. So today we've come down to the steel plant, which is where that electric arc furnace is planned to be built alongside the existing casters to see exactly where it's going to go and some of the complexities to some of the uh, operational issues of running uh, an electric arc furnace with or with, without uh, current steel making procedures. Delighted James Davis has joined us to take us around the steel plant today. James is the works manager steel and slab. James, it is a, a long and complex story, so we're going to spend a bit of time with you today talking through current scenarios and future scenarios. But firstly, you learn, a lot of people listening to this and watching this video won't have been to the steel plant. They won't understand the layout. Could you just walk us through exactly what happens in this works area? Yeah, certainly, Tim. Um, so if you look to, to my right-hand side, um, this is where the blast furnace or pig iron would come in from the blast furnace um, by the way of our torpedoes. Uh, the torpedoes then would be poured off into the ladles, hot metal ladles. It would go through our desulfurization plant and then would be loaded into the converters which are behind me as you head towards the south end of the plant. Another process which works alongside that is we are preparing in terms of our scrap and again you'll see the, the scrap box down the south end of the plant where typically you look in between loading of a 65 to 75 ton of scrap within the scrap box and then you're loading into converter with 260, 270 of iron and then you go through your steel making process and, and at the end of that process then you then tap into a weight of about 300 ton into a ladle towards the bottom side um, of the converter. That then gets transferred into our secondary steel making process, which I'll take you through as we continue the, the tour of the, the steel making plant. Yeah, so the whole process is predicated on sort of 300 tonnes ish. 260 comes in, 60 tonnes of scrap, 320 tonnes in the converter, uh, through secondary steel making with processes there which are set up for, uh, for uh, ladle sizes of 300 tonnes. The uh, turrets in the casters are set up for 300 tonnes. The tonne dish, the casters are all set up for 300 tonnes. And that is the existing process. Now in the future, we are looking to build an electric arc furnace with the existing assets. Now some companies would have probably built a greenfield site and put a brand new steelworks on that. That would have been a lot more money um, and would have allowed a lot more flexibility. But we're kind of limited because we're putting a, fire, a furnace alongside the existing assets. Is that fair? Yeah, certainly, Tim. So I've actually been out to the US plants looking at some of the greenfield site configuration. And we've looked at all options wherever you build a new mini mill. And in doing so, if you look at the configuration to the mini mill, in the US, you're typically only looking at about 800 people. So there will typically be more job losses in the area to the configuration we're looking at. We've also looked as a business to do smaller EAFs or to go for the larger size. But, but as you said, 
in terms of the complexities with using the current configuration, the two smaller EAFs. Whilst I know people say it isn't impossible, but the practicality of doing such doesn't make sound business sense. So, so what we've looked to do is build, as you say, your 3 million tonne, your 300 tap weights to try and complement the existing infrastructure we've got within our steel making process. Yeah. yeah, and I think we'll come on to the smaller EAF issue later on. What I'd like to do now, James, is, is I know that it's where the electric arc furnace is planned to be built is up the other end of the bay. Yep. So if we could walk up there, have a look where it's going to be, and then we can explain how that's going to work and the complexities of it in place. So James, we've come down to the other end of the bay now. We're uh, just by converter two. And as we look across here, uh, we can see some ladles uh, underneath us and beyond it is the current scrap bay and a scrap car up on the crane. This is where the new electric arc furnace is planned to go, is that right? Uh, yeah, no, that's correct. Um, so if you look to the left, you can see the preheats and uh, the ladles, so that's the hot metal ladles. Beyond there, you've got the scrap um, bay, the scrap box in here is where we load the scrap. So again, the scrap comes in from our score where you go in um, west of that. And then just beyond the scrap box is then where we do all the repairs to the hot metal ladles. Um, and within those zones are the two zones where the AF will be positioned and then it'll be fed up towards the top end which um, where the amenity area and so on is. Yeah, so the future operation of the art furnace, which obviously requires scrap as people know, the scrap's going to come in the kind of same area as it does currently. Yeah, yeah that's correct. You'd have your scrap bays would obviously become significant bigger yeah. given the amount of scrap we're going to load. So we're probably going to go up to about two million tonne of scrap yeah. um, against say, a a three, four hundred ton yeah. requirement now, so the whole area beyond there will become in terms of the scrap bay. But yeah, Tim, you're, you're right, the scrap will be loaded in into the AF and then into our secondary steel making process. So some people have uh, asked why, the, why it is that we can't build an electric arc furnace whilst currently running a blast furnace and a steel plant. What, what makes that so complicated, James? So, so we'd have the perfect spot, really, and, and, and if you consider, we would build, you'd have to build a wall, an imaginary wall from this area of the plant all the way across, two of which this area then becomes your construction site. So yeah. it's the area you'd have to position cranes, it's the area where you'd have to try and rehouse in terms of the preheat flares, where you'd have to look again as how you would move your scrap loading bay to the, the north end of the plant and, and you could see the congestion there with in terms of the fume extractions the torpedoes incoming let alone trying to use that area again where you'd be loading scrap so the complexities of loading scrap but also bringing scrap from your conventional areas right across the round of the plant yeah. to try and load into there so you've got a, a lot of complexities around man machine interface but also mixing molten metal with people but also beyond that You've got your hot metal repair area, so we'd have to look to rehouse that. And additional to that, and, and probably some of the complexities you don't see, is we've got our lance repair area, we've got our mechanical work shop down that area. We've got the loading of our bunkers, we've got um, the 25 ton lift. So again, a lot of the auxiliary kit, which say like your back office stuff, you need to run a steel making plant, yeah. holds home to the south end of the plant along then with all our facilities, our shower facilities and so on. So that, that's typically yeah. the heart, even though this is the main thing you would see from a steel making, that's in reality, that area is what makes it work. So I guess some people say, why could you not build the electric arc furnace on a greenfield site away from the existing steel plant? But I guess the issue with that is you might regret that for the next 40 years because you're then having to transfer liquid steel from maybe half a mile away to the existing casters. You're always going to put it next to the casters, aren't you, if you can? Oh, yeah, certainly. In terms of the plant configuration and the movements and the temperatures, it's fundamental that you build it as close as possible to the existing configuration. Um, anything outside of that you bring in, whilst, yes, you may gain something within about two to three years, what you would probably then do is make a bigger impact for the next 30 to 40 years 
which is a, certainly the legacy we want to leave behind where you've got steel making within this town for generations to come. Oh, James, that's great. Now, listen, the electric arc furnace is, is going to be just beyond there. Can we go and have a look exactly where it's going to be yes. and how close that is to secondary steel making and the casters? Yes, certainly. Okay, James, tell us where we've come to here. Okay, Tim, so we were just stood up there, um, just beyond the scrap box, and, and where we are now is the construction site to where the AF will be positioned. So, as I said earlier, you go west facing in terms of where the scrap's coming in, the AF will be built here, and then it'll be going up to the area where you can see the blue walkway, and then it goes into secondary steel making. So, as you AF, you would tap, you wait, and then you're in, and then you transfer across. Into hey, and, and as you've just said, we've just walked past lots of ladles being warmed up and there's lots of engineering processes in the background. So it's only when you walk through it, you really understand how much would have to be relocated if you were trying to run this place whilst you're building the arc furnace. It is a big old place, mind, isn't it, James? That's huge. Uh, <laughs> that's what excites us about the, the place and then show of the size of what we're going to achieve over the next few years because it's certainly looking to transform this business. And I want to just walk through now, if we could, to the, the secondary steel making and the casters, yeah. because I think this whole issue about this kind of 300 tonne uh, process goes all from the start, all the way through primary steel making, secondary steel making casters. And I think it'd be just helpful for people to understand what that looks like in terms of the size of the ladles and the casters and so forth. So maybe we could walk through yes, now. Certainly, let's head to secondary steel making. Great. So James, we've come to the secondary steel making area. It's a big long bay. Tell us uh, very basically what happens here. Okay, so this is where we take the, the tap from the ladle into secondary steel making and then it goes into the secondary steel making units. This is where we'll typically add different alloys for different grades and then it's on the transfer cars, it goes over into a continuous caster plant. So this is just really through the wall from where we've just been, where the new electric arc furnace is gonna go. But as part of the investment, we're investing in two uh, ladle metallurgy furnaces. Where are they gonna go? Yeah, so we'll be putting two brand new ladle furnaces in. That the assets we would keep would be the degasser, the RD. And then if you head, again, if you look down the south of the plant, we'll be positioned in terms of two ladle furnaces. So typically the whole construction is this end of the plant. Yeah, there's a lot of money going to go in here, isn't there, James, to be honest? And every part of the plant is going to be affected. Now, we've talked a little bit about um, some people proposing that you have two smaller electric arc furnaces and the complexity of doing that. And that complexity is important here as well. Can you explain why that would be difficult here? Yeah, so, so, so again, quite similar to the primary steel making, to the secondary steel making. If you, again, you go to the south end, that's typically where we do all our maintenance, repairs and refactory spraying for our secondary units. But not only that, if you look at the complexities, again, with, uh, you keep hearing me talking about ladle sizes. You've got a 300 ton ladle size, you'd have to go to a smaller ladle size, which then the ring, diameter of the ring, would be smaller and bigger. But the complexity of that, you can see how, how cranes, you'd have to change in terms of, you'd have two cranes, one doing the smaller ladles, the other one doing bigger ladles. You've got typical single point of failures or maintenance on those cranes because they're only designed to do one ladle. Again, if you look at some of the other kits, so if you look down, you've got the transfer cars, you'd have to do adjustment to transfer cars. But again, then, if you look at our secondary steel making units, again, if you look at the vessels to the RDD gas, again, they're designed around the, the diameter of our ladles. You then have to do some configuration to our degasser units. So, so again, the complexities of trying to run a plant which is dealing with smaller size ladles and bigger size ladles would bring its challenges in secondary steel making as well. And when we go to the casters, again, it brings some challenges there too. Yeah, and you mentioned the casters and that's going to be our next drop off point because, again, it's a fantastic place to go. I love going to the casters, love seeing the turrets and the heat from the cast slab. But, but let's pop over there yeah. and you can talk to us again about you know, the uh, work that's going to be going on there and the difficulties of having alternative configurations. Certainly, let's pull that way then. Thanks. Okay, James, so we've come to the continuous casters. We've just walked past casters one and two. We're at caster three. 
there's going to be a lot of work going on in Castor 3 as part of the new investment aligned with the electric arc furnace. Tell us a bit about that. Yes, yeah, so we got the Castor Enabler project. Um, if you see to my right there, you can see Castor 3 turret. Um, so that weighs 373 tonne. Um, and the plan is to fully replace the Castor turret. But then what's important and some of the things you wouldn't see as you go down into the machine, we're going to be replacing the whole backbone and the spray chamber. The spray chamber is the area. As the slab starts to solidify and grow and create a shell, you spray in water to try and get it through the cooling before you end up on the back end um, in terms of the slab process. Yeah. And again, there's some areas like some of the technical to your Jacob ladders where you, you bring in segments in and out. Um, so again, 20 million plus investment on cast of three um, and to match again in terms of cast of one, 20 million plus. The other complexities in this area and specifically if you consider the customer base, what you're doing cast of three is, is typically where our prime products go through. Just to change the turret alone, you're talking about this machine needs to be off for three months. Yeah. Okay, so even if, okay, you got a single furnace coming at us, if you wanted to do a smaller EAF, which would feed caster one, during that period, you're going to have to take blast furnace, whichever, off for at least three months while you replace the turret. There's other complexities in this area. So you would have heard me talk about 500 ton cranes. The turret bay 500 ton crane is going to be replaced as well. So a lot of investment as well also in the casters. Yeah, it is quite a complex picture, isn't it? And there's two things going on, isn't there? You know, there's the sort of refurbishment of the casters such that they're up to spec for when the electric arc furnace comes on. The seemingly almost impossible challenge of saying how would you run those whilst you still had a furnace and a steel plant and liquid iron coming through them. And then the option of people saying, well, you could have a one and a half million tonne electric arc furnace alongside a blast furnace. It's difficult to see any of those options working other than the one we're doing at the moment, which is quite painful, which is to shut the heavy end down, create a clear area where all of this work can be done such that everything's up and running for the end of 27. It's a difficult, it's a difficult to see any alternatives, James. Uh, again, Tim, we've spoke in terms of our secondary steel making process and the changes you'd have to do to take a smaller ladle and a bigger ladle and and that jigsaw doesn't change as you're working into the casters because again with the turret cranes you'd have to do similar configurations but also when you position the ladle onto the turret you'd have to have one for the bigger ladles one for the smaller ladle and then also in terms of the mold configuration as well so so it'd be a lot of compromise and configuration you'd have to do, but a lot of complexities you'd add in within what is already quite a, a logistical challenge anyway um, in steel making, as those who were involved in steel making would know. Yeah. Listen, I've been to the steel plant on the Castres hundreds of times in my career, and it's the first time I've come down to really understand the implications of this area by putting an electric arc furnace in. It's the first time, whilst they understand the fundamental story of reconfiguring the Port Talbot site for electric art furnace steel making. It's the first time I've really got into the detail with James's help today about how difficult that is, how complex it is, and what those different options would implicate the uh, layout, the build, and the cost of everything that's coming in. What I would say finally is that you can't help having a tremendous sense of excitement about what is about to happen in this works area. It is literally going to become the heart of the UK steel industry. It's going to be where the electric arc furnace is based. It's going to be where a new scrap management process is based. It's going to be linking in with some of the existing assets which are going to be upgraded with new ladle furnaces for secondary steel making with upgraded casters. The potential of this place is absolutely enormous. The other thing which strikes you is the unbelievable amount of money that's going to be spent and the unbelievable amount of work that needs to take place between now and that electric arc furnace getting up and running. James, listen, can't thank you enough for taking us around today and spending a lot of time with us explaining in a lot of detail. Uh, you know, hats off to you and your team and the project team that will be involved in this. Uh, take a deep breath, you've got a lot of work coming your way. Yeah, no, certainly, and, and, and to echo what you said, to be fair, the, the project team, the CapEx team and, and your Peter Jones is your Richie Arts have been fundamental to initiating this change. Yeah. Listen, James, thanks very much. Brilliant to see you.
Good luck.